thing about the uh, everybody asks, but nobody wants to answer it. It's a question that uh, for centuries people have asked. It's, it's almost, I would say, everybody who has ever lived has asked this question, but everyone who has ever lived doesn't want to go through what it takes to really answer it. Um, in life, I, I think most of you would agree that people who ask the most questions are children. <clears throat> My children asked the most questions that could ever be asked. In fact, they would ask questions that nobody's ever even thought of. And I didn't always know the answers, but that's neither here nor there. I heard about one little boy. He asked his dad a question that dad didn't want to answer. <clears throat> he said, Dad, where did I come from? And his dad started getting kind of shaky and, and clammy and, and he was about to start talking about the birds and the bees and uh, the little boy said, no dad, 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 Billy came from Cleveland, where did I come from? <laughs> Man, little girl asked her dad, daddy, if we can flush paper down the toilet, why can't we flush cardboard down the toilet? That's not a question to answer. That's when you call the plumber. And uh, children learn in those ways. And of course, there's always the child who has more questions than you could ever answer. Dad, what is the meaning of life? I don't know, son. Well, well Dad, why is it that countries go to war? I don't know, son. Well, Dad, why is it that dogs can't talk? I don't know, son. And then he said, well, well, Dad, I'm sorry I asked so many questions. Dad said, that's okay, son. How are you ever going to learn if you don't ask? <laughs> well, we're going to be learning this morning about a question that needs to be answered. And it's a question that was asked way back in Job chapter 14 and verse 14. It's a question that people ask, but nobody wants to answer. And Job asked it. So I want to take you back there just for the first part of his question. We'll look at his answer in a moment. He asked the question, Job 14, 14. If a man dies, will he live again? If a man dies... Will he live again? Is there life after death? When we have finished here on the earth, is there, is there more than just here? And he asked the question because it was especially important in his life at that time. But you say, well, why is, is that a question no one wants to answer? I can imagine people asking the question. But why does no one want to answer it? Because the only valid way to answer the question totally, if you think about it, is for you to die and come back. Now, I'd say, you go first. <laughs> you want to know the answer to the question? You die, you come back and tell us. None of us ever wants to do that. And so we may get answers to the question, but not necessarily valid answers. And I think when Job was going through his questioning, he apparently didn't understand the implications of the question. He didn't understand, but he was asking because his ten children had just died. Gone. He had just lo lost all of his stock. Um, Marauding countries had come in and taken away everything, but at least he still had his family. They were all gathered, probably in the oldest son's house, maybe having a great party together, all, all ten children. And uh, like my kids, when they get together, we, we just enjoy all the memory moments, and they love to talk about all the things they got away with when they were younger that we didn't know about. Well, his kids were having a great time, but they didn't know what was going on outside while they were having a party. A no Doppler radar warned them of the impending tragedy. Outside, the, the warm, moist air from the south invaded and met the cold, dry air from the north, 
And uh, the clouds began their circular dance of death. And that twister pointed its ferocious finger toward that house and crashed the party uninvited. You can imagine the heavy furniture flying through the air, the walls crashing in, and every child died. Uh, one, one servant was able to extricate himself from all of the rubble and, and, and came back in tears to tell Job, all ten of your children are gone. Every one of them. What do you do in a situation like that? You have questions. He had a question. If a man dies, will he live again? It was a legitimate question. And it's really on his mind. You can understand why he asked it. If a man dies, will he live again? Will, will my sons live again? Will, will my precious daughters, will, will they live again? Is there life after death? If I die, will I live again so that I will see them again? Is there anything after this existence? It was a legitimate question. And you know, each of us asks the question because we all die. Every one of us. We all go through it. I mean, when you stop and think about it, one man said it this way, death is the most democratic institution on earth. It allows no discrimination and no exception. The mortality rate of mankind is the same the world over. One death per person, and we all die. Every one of us dies. Psalm 89, 48 asks the question like this, Who can live and not see death? Or who can escape the power of the grave? The answer is no one. No one can escape the power of the grave. Harry Truman was fond of telling the story of a, a man who lived in a small town and he, he worked at the local um, uh, lumber mill and so forth. And one day he got hit in the head and uh, knocked out and they thought, he was, they thought he was dead. I mean, he didn't move. Uh, only thing they could do was take him to the mortuary and in that town it was so removed from everything else they didn't have any way to embalm the body so they just dressed him in a suit and they put him in a coffin and that afternoon he woke up hmm I'm in a box lined with satin I'm dead I'm in a suit. I'm really dead. But wait a minute. If I'm dead, why do I need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Confusing. But I can guarantee you, you won't be confused when that moment comes. Uh, you won't uh, have to say, am I dead, am I not? And it will come for every one of us. You don't have to worry about definitions at that time. Whether you're young or old, we all die. You can be rich, you can be poor. Men die, women die, the strong die, the weak die. You know, you can be a genius, have everything figured out, but you can die. You can be ignorant, not have everything out, figured out, and you'll die. <laughs> Elvis died, Lennon died, Princess died. Whitney died. See, I will die, you will die, we all die. Two people per second. That's 57 million people a year. And in the rate we've been going here at the church, we've had a great percentage of those. We all die. One out of every one. So you can understand the question. Job 14, 14, if a man dies... Will he live again? And no one can undeniably 
answer that question without dying and coming back. Uh, that's why Muhammad can't answer the question. There are millions of Muslims all over the world that would like to know that there is life after death. They just believe. But they didn't get it from him because he's buried in Medina. Saudi Arabia. His body's still there. So they can believe that. But they don't have it on great authority. Same time, Confucius, he's unable to give an answer to the question. He said a lot of good things. I mean, even as a Christian, you can look at some of his writings and they were pretty wise. But as far as the answer to the question about life after death, he can't answer because he's dead and buried along with some of his disciples in Khufu, China. Can't answer the question legitimately. Buddha has no answer. He's still in his tomb in Kushinagar, India. All of those great leaders, all of the religions of the world, all of the ones that you would think would be able to answer a question like this, they're all in the grave or in the tomb. But I am aware of the fact that there is an empty tomb outside of Jerusalem. It's a tomb that held the body of Jesus. It is now empty. And I think you understand why it's empty. In fact, you've probably read the story as many times as I have. In the gospel that Matthew wrote, he puts it this way. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came along with the other Mary to see the tomb. And behold, there had been a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. The angel answered and said to the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen, as he said. You remember what he said? He said that he was going to die. He said that in, in just three days after that, he would rise. He has risen, as he said. He said it, you can depend upon it. We have one man who died, came back to tell us. One other man, Lazarus, but he died again. Jesus, risen from the dead, as he said. You always got skeptics in the crowd. Some who would say, you know, not everybody believes that uh, nonsense about the resurrection. Preacher, make sure you tell them that not everybody believes that Jesus actually rose bodily from the grave. Okay? There are a lot of people who do not believe that Jesus actually rose physically, bodily from the grave. And you can disbelieve too. But if you disbelieve, then you disbelieve at your own peril. And so do they. The resurrection is the most important thing that has ever happened in the world. Or it is the greatest hoax that has ever been foisted upon the minds of men. To disbelieve it is to do it at your own peril. And that's why the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians. We're going to be studying 1 Corinthians after the next oh, couple or three messages on the family as we finish up that series. The Corinthian church, being in Greece, they believed what the Greeks believed. When you die, that's it. Oh, some of them believed in spiritual life after death, but not bodily. And so they did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. And Paul wrote to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And that's what he had been teaching them. That was his main message. Christ crucified, buried, risen again. <laughs> he said, then, if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Your faith, folks, is only as good 
as the object of your faith. If the object of your faith is all wrong, if there's no resurrection, if Jesus did not, you can believe all day long. Does your little good. It's worthless. Faith in vain. Moreover, he says, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead are not raised. <laughs> it's, it's probably one of the greatest arguments for the resurrection. All of those disciples and Paul Every one of them was willing to die for what they believed. And if it had been a hoax that they foisted upon the minds of men, who's going to die for that? He says, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And that's the issue. You're still in your sins. Some folks will say, well, big deal. We all, we all have sinned. Preacher, you've said before. All have sinned. Yeah, Paul said that in Romans 3.23. All have sinned. Fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't mean you're as bad as everybody around you. But all have sinned. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that Paul goes on to say in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Not just physical death. He's talking about death, eternal separation from God, nothingness in hell forever because you're still in your sins. And sin is the important thing that Paul wanted them to understand about. The, the state of Tennessee, maybe you read this, uh, they have a new way of handling drunk drivers. And I mean, let's face it, we need to deal with the fact that people are getting out and destroying families because they decided to drink and drive. And so uh, they have some things that if you're caught drinking and driving, you'll spend 48 hours in jail. There is a fine of $1,500. And, and then the one thing that is the most... Uh, well, most yelled about by the liberals, is that you are required to uh, spend three eight-hour days picking up litter and wearing a sign vest that says in four-inch black letters, I am a drunk driver. That's where I am. I'm a drunk driver. I did this. I was caught. And what is it our sign says out on the highway? If you... Drive hammered, you'll get nailed. Well, they get nailed. Some of the little vests that they wear are orange. Some of them are green. But you wear those vests. You know what I find in interesting is I see people wearing vests like these all the time when they don't even need to. You say, really? Yeah. Uh, they come into my office. I, I'm surprised at how many people wear these vests into my office when they come for counseling. I say, you're not talking literal, are you? No, but they wear them. They've got them on. They come in with a vest like, uh, I had an abortion. I can't get over it. And by the way, I, I have heard that from so many women and for the world, say, it's nothing, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. They say, I, I can't get over it. And, and, and they wear this around everywhere they go. It's always with them. Or somebody comes in with a vest that says, I abandoned my family. Uh, I cared more about me than I did about them. Some come in wearing vests like this one. I had an affair. And they say to me, forget what they tell you that whatever is done in Las Vegas stays there. It didn't. She found out. My kids found out. And this is always with them. Or the one I, I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have problems. 
I, I am a sinner so great nothing can take care of it. Listen. Jesus, on that Friday of the last week, spent those hours on the cross from early that morning. And then we're told that uh, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over the land. And he hung there. And it's not enough that he went through the agony of that, but when he screamed out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's so hard to imagine because Jesus claimed that he was one with the Father. Why would the Father forsake him? Because of your bests. All of those sins. All of those things that you, so many people hope they can just do enough good deeds and they'll have their vests taken away. The only problem is God never tells you how many you got to do. Because... There are not any deeds you can do to get rid of sin. Only a, a sinless sacrifice could do it. And Jesus hung there for you. And yet, I have to tell you, his death was not enough. Was not enough. That sounds wrong, doesn't it? But his death was not enough. In the sacrificial system that God set up, just think back when we studied in the book of Hebrews, in the Old Testament priest. It was when he came out and pronounced to the people that the sin offering had been taken. When Jesus came out of the tomb, it basically said, I have satisfied the eternal holy God of heaven. I paid for the sins of the world. That's why Resurrection Day is so vitally important. And you notice, I tend never to call it Easter if I can get away from it. We'll have to have a sermon on that some, sometime. Ishtar, false goddess. It's a mess that we've made out of this day so important to answering the, the most asked question in all the world that people don't want to have to answer for themselves. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. You do know that the world kind of pities you as you come in on Sunday mornings and spend your good time that you could be out doing other things. Yet you come and sit in a church. Well, if it makes you feel better, fine. But they kind of pity you. And Paul says if this truth about the resurrection is not truth, then indeed we are of all men most to be pitied. But here is his declaration. Now Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who are asleep. For since... By a man came death. By a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ. Not in religion. Not in church. Uh, not by baptism. Uh, not by good works. But in Christ all will be made alive. Forgiveness is a wonderful thing. You know, the psalm of, of David that he, he just cries and says, Oh, my sin is so heavy upon me. It's like the, the drought of summer. And if you really care about your relationship with God and, and you have sin in your life, you know that horrible distance, that, that guilt I have people who come in and say sometimes, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. Why do I feel so guilty? Because you're guilty. You've got to take care of the guilt. But you can't take care of it yourself. That's what Jesus did. And he will forgive you. Again, people say, well, I, 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 I'm too bad. To be saved. No, no, no. You're just the right person to be saved. 
The job description is written for sinners. Thou shalt sin. And only sinners can be saved. Got any sinners here? Nope. Don't raise your hand. Forgiveness. But there's more than just forgiveness. There is a future. That's what he's talking about. And, and, and that's why he ends 1 Corinthians 15 with... Uh, the wonderful thing that the curse of death has been taken away. So you go back to Job's question. Ten children gone. If a man dies, will he live again? Do you know he already answered his own question? We didn't read that part of the verse. He says in the second part of after his question, he says, all the days of my struggle... And life is a struggle. If it's not for you, something must be wrong with you. It is for the rest of us. Life is a struggle. And Job says, all the days of my struggle, I will wait until my change comes. I don't know how he knew it. I don't know if God had revealed that. I don't know if God spoke to him special. I don't know. But he knew. And beyond that, he also wrote in chapter 19, verse 25. He said, I know that my Redeemer lives. How did he know that? He lived back around the time of Abraham. How do you know your Redeemer lives? There's no way unless God had revealed that as well. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will take his stand on the earth. Job knew long before Jesus ever came. Why? Because God had said back in Genesis chapter 3 that he would send a redeemer. God had said he was going to take care of the sin of the world. And it could only be taken care of by someone who was a sinless, spotless lamb, who was also human. And at the last, he would take his place on the earth, and that's what Jesus did. So when we come to this time every year, it's the most joyful occasion because it means that my sin has been forgiven. I have a future in heaven for sure. He is risen Indeed. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you a question that I do every now and then, and uh, I'm always a little concerned about people's answers. You're sitting here this morning, and I want you to think with me. Do you know for certain that if you were to die today, do you know for certain that you're going to spend eternity in heaven? You know that. Just raise your hand and let me see. You know that you're going to heaven. Okay, you can put them down. And always, always when I ask that, there are people who do not raise their hands. Perhaps because some don't listen. Perhaps they don't want to answer. Or perhaps they're like some who say, you cannot know that. Yes, you can. Speaking through John, God wrote in John chapter 5, verse 13, these things have been written uh, that if you believe in the name of the Son of God, you may know you have eternal life. So that's the question this morning. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and rose again? If you'd like to do that this morning, the prayer is not the issue, but you might want to pray this prayer after me. Some people feel like they don't know how to pray. They don't know how to talk to God. It's simple. God, I realize I'm a sinner. I believe your son is the Savior. I believe that as your word says, he died for my sins and he rose again. You were satisfied with his pain. I accept your free gift of salvation. I want Jesus to come into my life and I want to become a part of your forever family. Thank you for saving me. 
If you did that this morning, then you can say to the Lord right now, Father, thank you for the assurance that we have of eternal life. We praise you for the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen.